welcome to this week's episode of The Real Country File. This week's episode is sponsored by sponsored by Awesome, an online accounts system for keeping on top of your farm finances. They're offering viewers of The Real Country File a package of worth up to £100 if you scan the QR code or visit the link below. It's a great way of keeping on top of your farm finances and can even help you set up a brand new company from just £12. Coming up on this week's episode, Angela, the you might know as my mum, speaks, uh, goes to visit Shropshire Grassland Society. But first, Stephen is out speaking to Ben Briggs from the Farmer's Guardian. Now this week on The Real Country File, we've got a superstar of uh, British agriculture. We haven't spoken to him for a long time, so we thought fitting to put him in one of the most picturesque locations anywhere in Lancashire. Editor-in-chief of the Farmer's Guardian, Ben Briggs. How are you, Ben? I'm very good, Stephen. And uh, yeah, such a superstar that you haven't spoken to me in 12 months. But yeah, good to be uh, back. Yeah, I know, it's good to get yeah. you along, isn't it? <laughs> You're a busy man, though. You are a busy man, aren't you? Difficult to tie down. Uh, in terms of agriculture at the minute, you have you know a lot of correspondence, a lot of reporters going out there on the farms. What's the state of feeling, would you say, at the minute of British agriculture? Well, we just had the Tory party conference. We've had a reporter out at, uh, at that for Farmers Guardian and obviously running into the uh, the argument and the spat between Jacob Rees-Mogg and Minette Batters about Rees-Mogg saying he wants hormone-treated uh, beef to come into the UK and the NFU kind of rebutting that. Um, but I think all of that, to be honest with you, mate, is playing into a bit of a a bit of uh, a bit of gloom really for some farmers in the industry it's a, it's a really seismic uh, shift that we're seeing in agriculture at the moment we've got obviously direct payments going away uh, environmental payments coming in and I, and I think some farmers are feeling a bit kind of uh, disconcerted about it all there's a real worry about what the future of the industry holds and when you've got a narrative like that about imports and free trade agreements, I think it's getting people down. But I mean, if we look, I mean, we're in a, an amazing part of the world here in Lancashire today, you know, uh, beef and sheep country, you know, some of the prices are actually holding up not too bad. So uh, I think it's it's going to be about getting through the autumn and the winter and, and seeing wh where we're at next year. But obviously it looks like we're going to have a general election coming as well. Could be changes. Could be changes and that, that'll provide a whole set of other challenges as well. Do you get the impression that the majority of farming, agricultural uh, community thought that maybe the, the the subsidies would at some point just continue and that it wasn't going to happen and now it is now they are going it's a bit a bit of a worry yeah i think you know a lot of farmers thought that the government would just do a u-turn so when they talked about phasing out bps in england i think i heard it time and time again farmers this mantra that well who's gonna you know we're here to feed the nation people have got to eat and I think the one thing that you've got to fundamentally realise about, particularly about the Boris Johnson government, trust, and those after it, I, I don't think they're too bothered about where the food comes from. Their main thing is to keep food affordable, to keep it cheap. Okay. They're not necessarily bothered about where in the world it comes from. And that has very real implications for agriculture. But yeah, I think a lot of farmers just thought, yeah, at some point the government had see sense, keep supporting it with direct payments, but they've not. You know, we're moving towards a more environmental agenda there's going to have to be more proactive buy into it uh, and uh, and at the end of the day it's not it's not going to replace all that cash that's uh, that's disappearing and everything costs money you know everything's gone up inflation cost of new machinery cost of, of livestock it, every, there's just been so many kind of hits if you will on agriculture hasn't there over the past 12 18 months there has and you know if you look at it in terms of the, the cost of fuel or energy you know uh, i mean fertilizer prices went through the roof all the inputs are going through the roof. But, you know, apart from the dairy sector that saw that leap to 50p a litre, not many other sectors have really seen prices keep up with, with those rising inputs. So, I mean, it's a challenge for the population as a whole, isn't it? There will be households right across the UK absolutely screaming, uh, especially if you look at the price of what it costs you to, to fill your car up. That's going back up again, isn't it? So, but farming's the same. But, you know, it is about feeding people. It is about you know, maintaining landscapes like we're in today. And we, we need a viable agricultural uh, industry in this country. But I don't think at the moment the, the government really prioritises that. Is there a sector in agriculture, really, that's got a bit of joy? Is the 
is this the one part that's that's kind of you know you're getting some positivity back from your reporters and from feedback? Yeah, listen, I, I don't think it. Uh, I don't think it is all doom and gloom. I mean, if you look at the beef and sheep sector returns, there uh, maybe while they've softened a bit, you know, the the prices remain uh, okay for for lamb and beef at the moment. Dairy has been on that roller coaster. I mean, I've I've covered that now for thirteen years, and we're, we're certainly on a downward part of the roller coaster. But still, thirty six p a litre. There'll still be a lot of farmers in it for the long term. Um, so we'll see how that plays out as well. But I think it's really interesting if you're looking Farmers Guardian in the classified and online, you're just starting to see a certain type of farm come onto the market. You know, it's not just those kind of lifestyle units anymore. You know, there'll be some some fairly sizable herds, 150, 200, 250 getting out of it. There'll be certain sheep, beef and sheep farms coming out as well because people, I, I think it's a, it's a time of reflection. The whole policy landscape's changing and people are making decisions that they have to do for themselves. So, yeah, really interesting time to be involved, but it always has been, mate, and we've been doing this for a long time. We have, mate, we have. But maybe we'll catch up with you then, what, in two or three months rather than 12? Is that all well, right? Well, that'd be nice, you know, just, <laughs> you know, you can always get in touch with me. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for coming, Ben. No problem. Thanks, Stephen. That was really interesting. Now, over to Angela. So I've come for an evening out in Shropshire tonight uh, at a meeting of the Shropshire Grassland Society and Joe is the person that's organised tonight's meeting. So Joe, Shropshire Grassland Society in a nutshell, what is it? Uh, what is it? It's a uh, farmers club really, uh, based around forage, uh, grassland as the name suggests, but more and more it's just a club for farmers to talk about cows or sheep and discussion group what they want so we talk about mainly cattle as I say but we have a few sheep members so how the meetings go depend on the audience. So during the winter the meetings are in a pub inside <laughs> yeah, but, that's it. Uh, but during the summer you actually go out and about and have farm walks. Yeah so between October and April we have winter meetings housed at the pub but then I say in the summer a few farm tours and uh, other tours I say we hope to get around a dairy or a bolster or things like that to keep it interesting for our members. Okay brilliant so we're going to have a chat in a minute to um, Annie who's been speaking this evening to the group yep. uh, but if there's anybody out there that would like to join the Shropshire uh, Grass Society, how do they um, get in touch? Um, so, um, Facebook, well, no, not Facebook, sorry. Um, on um, If you go to the Grassland Society, uh, Google that, you'll find that the main website on there, there's a sub link for Shropshire, my details are on there, uh, or uh, phone me, email me, WhatsApp me, and I can pass my details on later yep. so that can be in the description. That's fine. Yeah, so we'll put the contact details on the video description. Uh, but for now, we, uh, we're, we're waiting for our evening meal, uh, the, the post talk. Chips and sausage, so uh, that should be coming along soon. So, the main speaker tonight at the Shropshire Grassland Society is Annie Williams, and Annie is an expert on uh, minerals in, in livestock. So, Annie, can you just give us a bit of a, an overview of what it is that you've been focusing on tonight? Yeah, definitely. So, I advise on minerals in ruminants. So mainly covering sheep and cattle, I do do a little bit on goats and deer, but primarily what we've covered tonight is sheep and cattle and the differences in the sectors. So in sheep and beef, what we're tending to see is animals that are perhaps not supplemented with enough mineral and we could boost performance in those animals by supplementing particularly trace elements. So we've talked a lot tonight about cobalt, iodine, selenium. Whereas in dairy, what we're seeing is a slightly different picture. For a lot of minerals, we're seeing over supplementation or a not strategic uh, plan for how we're going to supplement dairy cattle. That's with one, of the, one of the really interesting things actually on your talk was that you very often go onto farm and actually tell them to stop putting minerals in because they're over supplying which yeah. is a really interesting yeah viewpoint. I go onto a lot of farms and they they say we're supplying mineral like this and it'll be like in a bagged mineral 
and I'm going, but there's compound feed there and there's a bucket there and what's that bolus box on the wall? And actually you've got minerals coming into those animals from all sorts of different sources and we need to look at that as a whole picture and say, do they need all this mineral? We only need to meet animal requirement, not excess. But in general, I think we're seeing much more uh, openness to new ideas and what we should be doing on farm. And farmers are used to working with consultants now and receiving advice. Um, it's not to say that we're hitting everybody across all sectors, we're definitely not, there's still work to be done, but I think in general, particularly when you start talking about economics, people are pretty susceptible to, to listen to what you're saying. Okay, yeah, so if you can say, right, I can save you money yeah. by doing this, this and this, yeah. then it's... Or I can boost your profitability. Okay. You know, there might be a saving, there might be a boost to profitability by changing what you're doing. Yeah, okay, great. But in addition to all the, the work and the busyness that you've got going on with the, the mineral consultancy, you've also just got a Nuffield scholarship as well. So that is very exciting. Can you tell us what that actually is all about and what I you're going have, to be focusing yeah. on? Yeah, so I'm really lucky. So I work full time in my day job for the Centre for Innovation, Excellence in Livestock. And I'm really lucky that they've allowed me to do this Nuffield scholarship looking at minerals. Minerals is what I love. So I'll be looking at basically minerals and ruminants and whether we're getting the advice for minerals and ruminants right. So we see quite different advice globally. So what we're advising in the UK is different to what's being advised in New Zealand, different to what's being advised in the US. And that comes down to sort of supplementary levels, but also diagnostic reference ranges. What we're diagnosing as a deficiency here might not necessarily be diagnosed as a deficiency in other markets. So I really want to look at the advice being given, whether it's right, how it compares to other markets and what we can learn globally from looking at what's happening in other countries. So you want people to get involved in your study and your research. So how, if anybody's watching thinking, yeah, I'm, I'm interested in mineral issues overall, how can yeah. they get in touch? So easiest way is to email me. Um, but I'm also on all social media, so Twitter, at Nutrition Annie, or Facebook, Instagram, uh, um, Mineral Advice. So you can contact me or not. And I'm basically interested in talking to anybody that either advises mineral on farm or is a farmer that has strong views on the advice that's going out onto farm, vets looking at diagnostic reference ranges and how they interpret them. Anybody that's involved in that in any sphere, I'm really interested to talk to and what they're delivering and what minor field might be able to help them with. Excellent. Okay, right, brilliant. We will put all of that information on the video description as well as obviously being at the bottom of the screen as well. So feel free to get in touch and um, yeah, let's see if we can get more mineral knowledge uh, overall in the country as well. So that's it for this week's episode and thank you to everyone for watching. Once again, this video is sponsored by Awesome. Their online farm accounts systems can save you a whole load of time and money. So don't forget to click the, the link below and you could be offered a package of up to £100 for farm finance account system. Thank you. See you next time.